everyone's okay. All right, so so here's the plan. What we're, I'm going to do now is I'm just going to read Second Samuel seven, and then I will ask you to answer uh, the questions that I have, and uh, we'll just we'll 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 make the the list, and then we'll also do the same for Psalm. We we have to go a little bit fast, so so maybe we won't answer all the questions, and then and then we'll get into the text for tonight. Okay, so. We're looking first at Sam, 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 to 17, the, the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God made with David and the promises that he gave to him. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go to my servant David. Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt on this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus the Lord of hosts, the Almighty God, says, I took you from a pasture from following the sheep, that you would be prince over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From that time that I appointed judges over all my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover declares the Lord to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke to David. So, wow, so amazing. Okay, let's go ahead and let's just, what I want to do over here is this is the text that we're going to be discussing on the right. So what I want to do is I just want to come over here and I want to, and, and I'll explain what I'm looking for in a second. Observations from 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, uh, 4 to 17. Okay, so what I want to, I want, the focus for today is I want you to look up, what are all the promises that God gives to, to David? Let's list them out here. He will make for you a great name. So he will um, make... A great name. Excellent. What else? Uh, verse 8, part B, that you should be a prince over my people. So, so David's a, a prince over the people, but so let's, 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 let's tweak that. So his son is going to come and what is his son going to, do, to be? David's the prince or the king. Um, uh, what's his son going to be? Because this here, just to be clear, this here is present tense, right? This, so this is happening in the present. So we're looking at, at future actions related. So this is related, but what's the, what's the future action related to this? Anyone? The greatest is the last part. Okay. So, so your name, um, your, not, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. Future, let's do this, future kingdom, right? And this is forever, right? So his, so his house is established. So this is, this, is, uh, this is more than just 
kingship, right? This is his um, established forever as well, right? This, this concerns, Biba, this concerns family and seed, right? What else? What other promises are in the Davidic kingdom? Verse 14. No more oppression from wicked people. Okay, so um, no more oppression, no more oppression. A, a place of rest, right? There's a place of rest that they won't be disturbed, right? Violent affliction. So let's add here violence. So we have, he's going to have a great name. He's going to have a future kingdom. His house will be established forever. There's no, there's no more oppression from the wicked. The people are going to be in a, in, in a place of rest. Anything else? They, they will have judges. This one here in my top, move no more. I think this has reference to being scattered. This move no more. Yeah. So it's no, they're no longer sojourners, right? My family has been moving for such a long time. And even now we're, we're staying with my father. We have, we, we don't have a, a place of, of permanence and rest yet. And so anyone who has been in transition for a long time knows how, how significant this promise is. So this is a ending their sojourning, ending the people sojourning. And any other promise going on here? Anything else? Promise of offspring. Yeah. Promise of offspring. A lot of promises here. <laughs> Incredible, right? Everything the kingdom lasted forever. Will last okay. forever. Yeah, so we have we have that here. So the, the kingdom's forever, the house is forever, the, the people have rest, there's no more oppression. Is he not going to adopt David's David's son? And David's son's going to become his own, right? So he's going to adopt David's son. I think in, in my in my in my Bible it says, I will set up your seed after you. Set up or establish. I think establish could be establish your seed after you. Establish. After you. Yeah. So the whole point here is that this is going to be uh, established, permanent, etc. Like that. He will adopt his his son. Right. So this is not concerning the eternal Son of God, but the man Jesus. Does everyone see that the heresy? is that they saw this adoption as referring to uh, that, that there's just a man and then he was adopted and became the son of God. That's not true. But from a human standpoint, once we see this whole thing play out, we recognize that David's son is actually, in fact, the eternal son of God. Do you see what I'm saying? But concerning this reference here, at, at, at this point, we see that he's, he's, a, he's adopting the son of David, who at this point they're thinking is just a man, he's going to become his son. And this is going to be for anointed. Anointing for, for his kingly and representative role. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is not in any way, this is an unclear, we don't know the full clarity. Once we come to the New Testament, we recognize, oh man, Jesus is, is more than just a man. He's in fact, the eternal son of God. And so this is not when we use this word, adopting the son, we're not speaking of it from Christ's eternal sonship, but from the promises within the story of redemption, the promises within the story of the, of the, of the Davidic Abrahamic covenants. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is within the, the economy of salvation, not within the eternal sonship of, of Christ. And that was the mistake historically. And you can see how it just easily goes into heresy, right? You can easily say, oh, Jesus is just the adopted son of God. That's it, right? If, if all you had was 
was Samuel. We could see that, but there's, we don't have time to really go into all these details because there is, there is things going beyond any, any other promises. I think these are pretty good here. I think these are, this is a pretty good range of meaning. Let me just come back here just to make sure there's nothing else we should add. Team, how about the steadfast love? Yeah. Okay. No. So that's really good. And so let's add that here. So there's a promise of, let's add that. There's a promise of steadfast covenantal love. God commits himself to David. All right. That's good. So what I do want to bring, I want to bring your attention to is several things. Okay. What I want to note here is that because obviously this, this eventually comes into discussions is there a millennial kingdom when, you know, what's the relationship with Christ and, and, and the, the church and Israel, right? These are all, these are all debates. So what people will say is that in order to fulfill the Davidic, so this, what this is the big idea here, this is the, let's just write down the big idea here. This is the, the Davidic covenant. And what I want to highlight over here is that some of these things, so for example, planning a people in a place of rest, right? So let's highlight some things here. Planning in a people in a place of rest, no oppression from the wicked and the violence, okay? The establishment forever, the kingdom forever, the ending of the people's sojourning. These are all, these are beyond old creation promises. Does everyone, does everyone see that? establishing a kingdom forever. There's no fulfillment of that, even if it begins, right? So people will say the fulfillment is in the millennial kingdom. No, because it's an eternal kingdom, right? It's beyond that. The house is established forever. Its fulfillment is in eternity, right? Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is, this is uh, eternal fulfillment, okay? The fact that there's no more people oppressing there's no more wicked or violence in the millennial kingdom, right? If you read that in a literal and you accept a literal reading, or, or a, I would say literal wooden, I, I would say that they, it, it's misread how, how people have understood the millennial kingdom. But, but, the, but the end of the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20 is this final cataclysmic battle in which all of these evil people surround Jerusalem and right? They surround Jerusalem and then God has to destroy them with the breath of his mouth. He has to come in and rescue them, right? Uh, and so, so you couldn't say that the millennial kingdom is the fulfillment of this promise because there's still a pressing of the wicked in that kingdom. <laughs> See what I'm saying? The wicked and the violence is still going on, okay? So this is what I'm trying to get at is that these promises are beyond old creation promises. They're now eternal New creation, incorruptible promises. Is everyone tracking there with me? So it's so you can see earthly. There's earthly things. So for example, the son's going to be, be is going to be disciplined by God, and so clearly we see that Solomon was. We see that Rehoboam, uh, the son of Solomon, also. So you have these. You have these earthly promises that, that, that are partially fulfilled in David's offspring. His house is established, but they eventually, right, they go into exile, right? But so we have these, we have these earthly promises and then promises that transcend earth, earth, right? They're moving into the eternal, okay? And so we need to be looking at these from an internal perspective, and we're going to see it in Luke. We're going to see it in Luke. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments before we go on to, before we go on to Psalm two, any questions or comments? So let's go on now to uh, Psalm, Psalm two. As we read this, I want us to be thinking, is this eternal? Is it like earthly or is it moving into the eternal? Okay. So, so. <laughs> So I think we're going to see both. The accent will be upon the eternal. Look at this here. And then I'll ask about questions. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? <laughs> the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together 
against the Lord and against his anointed, the Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds apart. Let us cast their cords from us, right? They don't want to submit to the Lordship of God Almighty, right? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He mocks them. <laughs> this is my lightweight, right? Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, says the Messiah. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, the Lord declares, and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. <laughs> be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish along the way because his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who trust in the Son. So I have made some interpretative decisions there as I read it. Uh, maybe you could have noticed that. So let's, let's look here. I hope that you're seeing both earthly and eternal, right? So let's talk here. Let's, let's look here now at, at Psalm 2. Let's first ask... Number one, uh, what are the actions of the, the nations? What are, what are the nation's actions? Just someone give it to me. Rage. Number one is rage. Yeah. Okay. So let's write this down. So we got, we got here rage. What else? The plot. <laughs> There's plotting. What else? What, what, what's the specific content of the plotting now? Against, it says it against this anointed. Yeah, so the plot is against, against the Lord. It's like in, in one sentence, it's like a, a rebellion against the anointed. So yeah, rebellion, rebellion. And so specifically, what are those actions for the rebellion? Boy, boy, boy. What, what, what's the specific actions of that rebellion? Uh, in, in human terms or in the spiritual realm? Well, yeah. So just so, so obviously the literal thing is cast our cords from us, right? So what, yeah, what yeah. does that symbolize? What, so, so spiritually or it's, what's the it's, symbolism? It, yeah, it's like removing you from, the, from, from being the head of the, so, as the sovereign head. Yeah. yeah. I will remove you. I will replace you. Uh, something like that. It's, it's like move the cord then you have no more strength and i can you can be replaced anytime so at the same time the cord is also some some in some way represents the the king the kingship or the kingdom yeah so it's removing, the strength of the kingdom yeah, removing the authority right so yeah it's I something mean, like, I, yeah so it's so it's not that it, it, in one sense it's a grotesque imagery because it could you imagine like a person being on a cord but the imagery there yeah. is that of an animal right the animal the animal has the cord of the master and the master leads it, whether it's oxen, it has the yoke, what, you know, uh, whether it's, it's, it's a, a goat, right? So you have a, so you have the goat, right? The goat has the cord the the carabao has the cord. It only goes where the master says it. And so what they're saying is cast off the authority. We do not want to submit to the Lordship of the Lord or his Messiah. So fundamentally, this is an issue of, of, of lordship so big big idea big idea here is this idea of of lordship or we could say rule right they don't want the lord to rule and that's the fundamental issue today people don't want to submit to submit to the lordship the rule and reign of the lord jesus christ and so so look at this Look at, so let's go here now. What is the reaction? So this is the, the first the reaction of the, of, the, of the people. What's the action of, what's the response of the Lord God? What's the response? Uh, is he, no. <laughs> so, 
so the actions of God are are <laughs> laughing. <laughs> What else? What are the other actions of him? What is what does he do? So we can say laughing. What are what other action words do you see there? He mocked them. Mocks? No, that's really good. I mean, it's it's grotesque. It's 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 comical, right? It's comical. What else? Moving from laughing and mocking, what is the what is the subsequent actions of the Lord God? So we're looking right now. This one, this one, the sentence in in my in my cup is. He will speak to them in wrath. Uh, I don't. I do not have a picture. How do you speak in wrath? <laughs> in anger, perhaps. He will distress them in deep displeasure. Yeah. So, so always remember and never forget, the power of God is through the mouth, right? So, the final judgment in 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 Revelation 19, Jesus will kill everybody with 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 the the, the two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth, the power of God, he creates all things through the word of his mouth. And so the speaking in the wrath is that of declaring judgment and actually meeting out the punishment. So, so think about the power being in the, the, the word of God, power in the word of God. There's judgment going on here. What, what else though? So we have, um, what other actions does God do? What's the other big actions that God does? So will terrify them. Okay, so so yeah, so this is so their but that's their response, right? So their response is terrify, but still there's more actions here. Maybe we're we're not seeing it. What's the big action? Let's come back here to the text. I'll bring it up here. What's the, let's come back up here. We have here, okay, terrify. Okay, so yeah, so we could say here he will speak he will speak to them in wrath. This one I will declare the decree. Okay, but before that What's the big statement in verse set, six? Set my king, set my king. This is enthronement. God has already decided who will <laughs> sit on the throne. With or without human consent. <laughs> With or without consent. I will tell of the decree, right? So this is the decree. That's the, the declaration of the king, right? The people are rebelling against the king of the earth. As for me, <laughs> we're going to cast his bonds off. No, I'm going to establish my king on Zion, right? Zion is the, the greatest mountain. This is the, the greatest mountain, right? So think about this, right? The rock in Takloban, right, Henry? It, Yolanda people went to the rock. That's where they went. Diba. They, they climbed and they went towards the mountain behind Takloban that overlooks San Juanico, right? Uh, the mountain is a place of steadfastness. No one is, is being moved by the wind, by if you are on the rock. <laughs> and so this is, Zion is the eschatological mountain of God. So they say the big, the big word is eschatological mountain. That's why we will never be moved because we are, we are on the mountain of God. And so God plants his king on his holy mountain. I don't like this hill. This should be mountain. The, the translation in the Hebrew could also be mountain. Let me just confirm that here. So let's just really briefly come here. Let's go to, let's go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Yeah, looking at the, bout, at the bottom, the mountain is, uh, the word is har, mountain or mountainous region. I don't know why they do hill. It should be Mount Zion, on Zion, my holy mountain. I, you know, I'm just disappointed in that translation. It should be, it should be the, the mountain of God, eternal mountain. Okay. All right. So let's come back here. So big action here is establishing, enthroning his king, right? Big action enthroning the king okay and then look at this here what are some other what are some other actions here so there's the decree there is the declaration for who is his son right who is his messiah so this is going to be jesus so so let's let's just add here we're going to have declaration of his son 
let's let's do this declaration of his representative and his man who's the man <laughs> jesus is the man the messiah the son of david right all these other kings they want power putin wants power you know xi wants to be the ruler of the world right the ayatollah of iran wants to be the big dog right all these guys have visions of of conquest napoleon before stalin all the all the kings they want to be the big dog over all the earth but there's only one and it's jesus christ okay let's move on here let's move on here so any other actions that god does from this text i will give you the nation for your inheritance <laughs> the nations are given as an inheritance <laughs> oh my goodness think about that for a second god owns it all the earth is his possession think about that and he's like these guys are raging they're so angry and, and the lord god's like don't worry you guys are all going to be the inheritance of 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 this of my son right oh my goodness so powerful the ends of the earth, your possession. What, what's being said in eight, the nations are your heritage, the ends of the earth, okay? So think about this. The nations, the ends of the earth. What does this include here? What is the nations? So you're, you're, com you're combining people here. What does this signify here? The ends of the earth the end of the earth would this not be more land so big idea what is he giving we can summarize i'm going to give you the the nations your heritage the land of the earth the all the way to the end as your possession what what can we signify big let's combine the two what, what's the big idea what's the what's the comprehensive picture here the whole world yeah. Right. The, the, the whole, the whole earth, right? <laughs> bad, bad drawing, but what's being refer referred to here is the, the whole earth. So whereas David's, David's kingdom was just in Palestine, right? Now it transcends all the whole earth land and people okay so let's come back here could that this, be the reason why there are there are so many people who wants to rule this world because of this uh prophecy that to david that probably they were saying that maybe i am this uh son of david being referred to to rule the world to rule this whole earth at the end of the day i mean right it's it's it's, it's conjecture what's in their mind but we can at least say that that's the desire for man right? Because man was given dominion. Adam was given dominion over the whole earth. He messed it up. And so now we have this tendency within us to dominate, to, to world dominate. So whether knowingly or not, that's the intention. Koya Bobo, you're correct. There is this intention and it's coming from Satan because it's God who establishes, but Satan wants to establish. And so he works through all of these men and kings to usurp the will, the decree of the Lord God, because he wants to corrupt it. He wants that kingdom of darkness to, to rule and reign. That, that's, that's really good. That's a really good observation. And that's what it is. That's what's happening. So whether they know it or not, that's their, that's their focus. And no doubt some people have thought that. I'm sure some people have thought that. But yeah, this perishing here, and I'm just going to, we're going to end it here. The perishing now is moving already to eternal eternal perishing right and and the connection here this eternal is coming back up to the judgment so these two psalms are connected as like a as like a a one two punch okay and so this is already the eternal referencing to the eternal judgment the blessed is the man right who meditates in the in the, in the law of the lord day and night his he'll be like a tree planted right so already here this is this is eternal uh, final judgment. 
So what I'm trying to get at is that there's there's physical components, but it's already transcending to eternal. And so what's being promised in in in, in David in Psalm in in Second Samuel seven, and then now here is this eschatological kingship of a kingdom. Okay, that's what's being promised to Jesus Christ. And so even looking here about the nations being his inheritance, and then this call to, to serve the Lord, to be warned, to be wise, and to rejoice, this already has significances. So this, this will preach right here. This already has significances in Matthew 18 to 20 and the, and the Great Commission. Okay, we're going to come back here if we have time. Does, ever, does everyone see that? This is already great commission type stuff. This is why this is why all authority has been given in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. I have the authority. You go you go bring them into my kingdom. Don't worry about the rule and authority of other kings. They're already mine. So not seeing these big ideas you, up until now we're like okay Tim so deep. It's so theologically deep. Where's the practical implication? Great commission, baby. <laughs> you have the authority. God has established his king on Zion, and you have the authority given to you by the power invested in me <laughs> in heaven and on earth. <laughs> Go, right? In Takloban, you have authority to make disciples. In Samar, in Luzon, in Cebu, you have the authority by God Almighty Himself. This is not just spiritual. The, the authority extends physical and spiritual. You're, you're to live a holy and pure life, not just in church, in the professional realm and how you conduct your affairs in your businesses, because Jesus Christ and His decree is already there. You have the authority to command people in your neighborhoods if they're sinning. No, you should not be sinning. You should be living a holy and pure life. You should not be engaged in adultery. So this has incredibly practical, once you see this big image here, incredibly practical uh, for our churches to know that you have the authority. I'm learning to despise this. It's like a suggestion. I suggest you do this. I suggest you do that. It's like, no, <laughs> authority. You do this. You do that. Now, of course, if it becomes starts to become your opinion, then maybe you should just say suggest. But where the word of God is clear, we should boldly from the pulpit in the small group. I suggest, don't I suggest the word, Jesus Christ, the king on Mount Zion commands us to do this. Okay. our passage for tonight. We've really set the context, but we do want to work through this passage. And we just really want to see the, all of those themes that we picked up. We want to see this being realized in the man, the God, man, Jesus Christ. And so that's really the focus for, for this evening now. And so um, let's go ahead and read the word of the Lord. So I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading uh, Luke 1, 26 to 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee, whose name is Nazareth, to a virgin who was engaged to a man, whose name is Joseph from the house of David. And the name of the virgin is Mary. And coming to her, he said, greetings, O one who is favored. The Lord is with you. Now she was troubled by the message, and she was considering what sort of greeting this is. And the angel said to her, do not fear Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you yourself will conceive, and you will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, the Lord God will give to him the throne of David, his father, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And so Henry has preempted us, but you can see all those different promises, all those different promises can be summed up in what Henry brought out. I partially ignored his, <laughs> I partially ignored his comment because he was free. <laughs> 
was preempting my my lesson. Henry, Henry, you get the gold star. The the fundamental blessing promise that's fulfilled. If we can sum it up, the Davidic co- covenant summed up in one word or phrase: the eternal kingdom. And so Henry would. <laughs> Henry, Henry sneak attacked me. Okay, let's let's work through here. Let's look at at, at truths and significances, and um, don't be hesitate to interrupt me. And um, just some things I want to highlight here for us. Uh, so I just want to I'll, I'll work through here. So um, number one we see here is that in the sixth month. Okay, so we have this. This is a time referent. This is time. So this is be thinking about. Uh, why there's so much information here. Remember, paper was in short supply in the first century. You, you wanted to be very efficient with your writing in the first century, okay? And so here we have, let me, let me rotate over here. So we're looking right now at modifiers of the action here. All right, so we have, so right now we're focusing on, I wanna, I wanna highlight for you all the different modifiers of the action. And what does this signify? Because this is going to have an apologetic purpose. So number one, th- there is a time reference to the sixth month. And so looking, this is, this is referring, the sixth month refers back to Elizabeth's pregnancy. Pregnancy, and this is with, with, with John, uh, John the Baptist, okay? And then we have the, uh, the angel Gabriel, who is sent by God. So this is the action. And then the, so the actor is actually God. Is everyone tracking there with me? The actor is God. Okay. And an, the angel is being sent. So, so the message that's going to be given, the message from the angel is actually going to be the very message of God. Okay, that's the big takeaway here. Okay, so we have number one, we have a, a, a time reference. And then look at this, we have a, a geographic location here. So not only do we have a time reference, we have a, ge- a, a geographic location. And then we have a, a description of that. So there is a lot of details being given here. Okay, so we have the geographic we have the geographic location. So this is the, this is the number, this is number one, this is number two. And then we have, we have the object of virgin. This is the person who's going to receive the message. So think about this for a second. Okay. Incredibly powerful, right? There's so much information being given here and look at the, look at the description, this virgin number one, she's engaged to a man. And then she's also identified here. She's identified as the Virgin Mary. And then on top of that, her husband is identified as Joseph and from the house of David. So let's, let's draw. So look at all of this. This is a, a lot of information that, that is, would be, it would be hard to think like, yeah, this person is making this up. Okay, and so let's just write this out here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the whole point that Luke is trying to make is that this is historical fact. Does everyone see that? And so maybe not so much in your situations, but for sure in America and, and growing more and more, especially in Manila, right, is that is the denial of the historicity of the scriptures, the, 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 the denying the historicity of, of the Old Testament, especially with the Pentateuch and Old Testament history. Because notice here, this is not just a story about Jesus. Notice how this involves the house of David. So this is going to be bringing up for us the Davidic covenant. So people, and you're going to hear more and more about people saying, it doesn't matter if the Exodus is real. It doesn't matter if Adam is real. It doesn't matter if Jonah 
if those events happened in Jonah. It doesn't matter if David was a historical, he's myth. It's a myth that's teaching us truth. What matters is the resurrection. What matters is Jesus. That's all that matters, right? Just the truth that the gospel is, I'm telling you, this is coming all over America. It's in mega churches. A Andy Stanley now, now you know, in, in using his name for sure, he would he would he would push back on the characterization. Fair enough, but from a from a from from a large perspective, I would say a fair perspective. People are denying all these other events aren't really important as long as we're preaching the gospel and we're we're preaching Jesus Christ. All these other tangential you know, the higher critical views on whether or not the nation of Israel is real, all those different events, that's, in, that's not really significant, okay? But the problem is <laughs> the foundation of the gospel is in the Davidic covenant. This is the foundation. What we're, this, is the, this is the promised part. If the promise isn't real, how can we trust the fulfillment? It, they're inseparable is my whole point is what I'm trying to make. They're inseparable. And so here, Luke is belaboring the point to say these things happened. Notice here before we move on, the accent on re re repetitive words. I'll use a different color here. Repetitive words. Virgin. <laughs> The accent is on the virgin birth. It's there, right? They don't waste paper. Like every word counts in the first century. To restate something is to accent something, okay? So let's move on here now. So, so essentially here, we could have big idea. This is essentially the, the setting, okay? The setting of the story. So if I'm preaching this, point number one the setting. And I would, you, there's so much there you, you, you can go into. Okay. Then you have here him coming to her. And so we could talk about the introduction or we could say the, the greeting, right? Look at, look at what the angel says to, to Mary. We either accept this as historical or not. We don't say it's not historical. Let's still believe. No, it's, it's real or not. My, my comment is become a man, right? Don't be willy nilly. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Become a man and take a stand. So look at this. Number two, introduction greeting. Look at, look at the greetings here. So the angel comes to Mary and says, greetings. Look at this. The Lord. The Lord is with you. Look at this here. Now, look at this. Uh, let's first look at this, this address here. O one who is favored. O one who is favored. So this is the, the address. Let's think about this for a second, okay? Now, people will say that Mary earned this, right? That she earned this favor, and, and people will talk about that. But le let's... Let us, let's look at really briefly, let's investigate this. So if we're looking over here, we are going to be doing a, in this study, we're going to be doing a word study right here. Okay. We're going to be doing a word study to the left. Look at this here. So we're going to be exploring a word study on O one who is favored. Okay. So let's go ahead and quickly do to, to, to our text over here to the left. Um, let's go to to um, Luke. Look here. Uh, o, o favored one. O favored one. Okay. Everyone, we're looking at this word right here. Okay. And so this idea of O favored one, people are like, oh, you know, Mary earned it. She earned this position. That's how we could take the English. Again, a tr interpretation, not the best. I, I am disappointed with this translation. Because when you come over here, so you can look over here. Let me just blow this up here so everyone can see. So looking over here, you can see it at the bottom, right? So it's track. I'm tracking here from left to right. So and coming uh, and, and he came to her and he said, greetings. Look at this word now. Kakarito mene. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so here, so, so there's a, there's a, there's a typo with, with my thing. I've got to message them. So looking here, this kekarito mene at the bottom here, they're saying it's a perfect middle tense, but over here we can clearly see this is a perfect passive verb. Okay. So it's a perfect passive participle. Okay. Now I'm going to explain to, to, to you what each one of those means. Okay. So, um, and we're not doing this for all words that you notice that this is not, this is not what we do all the time, but this is very, this is incredibly important to understand that this is not Mary earning her favor. It's favor and grace being given to Mary. Okay. We're going to see that. Okay. So let's write this out and let's deal with this. So this is a perfect passive participle. So this is when Greek matters, grammar matters. One day we will offer Greek. So perfect is like has, it's a, it, this is a past action with present results. Okay. And we'll come back to that. Passive is passive means that she is the object, not actor. Okay. Participle is just, this is moving. This is, this is a, a verbal noun. So it's the address. Okay. So what's the big takeaway here? What's the translation? So it's a past action with a present result. Okay. So if I say, if I say to you, you're, you're, and I've done this illustration before. I have a dog, right? Bon Bon. Bon Bon is very aggressive. Okay. If I say I have loosed, I have loosed the dog salabas, right? I've, I've loosed the dog outside. That's a past action, but the implication is the present result is the dog is still running around, right? So you, if you go outside, you could be bitten. So when I say I have loosed the dog outside, no one wants to go outside because they recognize the, the, the present result is still ongoing, okay? And so here, the perfect action is the giving of grace and the, and the present result is still going on, okay? It says to be gracious or to be favorable, to bestow on freely. Can everyone see at the bottom? If we come down here to the bottom, uh, this word, this, this word um, comes from the Greek. So this is, so I'll just write this out. This, this Greek word here, this is, the, this is the verb to be gracious. The noun form is charis. You can see the same root, okay? The same root. And this is literally grace. So you can see the root there, charis, okay? You see karatao and charis, okay? And so... The noun form is grace. The verb form is to be gracious. Okay. So this literally is, so if we're going to write this out, this translation, so everyone can see, um, greetings, O one who has received grace. <gasps> And is not every calling a gracious calling, right? <laughs> and we also, from this word, we can, we can, we can think about, we also have, uh, we also have the gifts as well. So these are all interrelated. Okay. These are all interrelated. Okay. But what the, the accent I want to put here is, is, is that Mary is not someone who has earned God's favor. She is someone who has received the favor of God. Does everyone see that here? And so to read it as, oh, she's earned God's favor is to totally turn the meaning on its head. Okay. And so coming back here, this isn't a terrible translation because she does, she is favored by God. <laughs> okay. So not a terrible translation, but it, it's masked. It can hide the true significance here. So think about this. And this will make sense why Mary's like contemplating what's going on. Cause she's just like, I'm troubled in my heart, right? Because she doesn't think she's done anything and she hasn't. It's the gift of God. So look here. So greetings, oh, favored one. Look at this declaration here. Look at this declaration here. The Lord is with you. 
Look at this declaration here. The Lord is with you. So whenever you see the Lord is with you, number one, this signifies presence, the presence of God, the presence of God. And this is leading towards a commissioning <laughs> for a mission, right? Go to all nations, making, making disciples. And I am with you. I am with you always to the end of the age, right? The Lord says to Moses, don't worry. I will be with you. My words will be in your mouth. <laughs> So this is, this is your favorite one. The Lord is with you. And so this is why she is troubled in her heart and she's considering these things. She's undeserved. She doesn't know what's going on. The Lord is with you. <laughs> and so she's troubled. Like, what am I going to have to do? Right? What, what's going on here? What's the theological construct that describes how favored we are? I've been teaching this every week. Who are we in union with? Christ, right? So yes, she has the presence of God. She's favored. She has the grace of God upon her. But if you are in the body of Christ, <laughs> you are in union with Christ. You are the same. There, you're absolutely right. There is no difference. There is no difference. Gr great point. And so this really calls to attention. Diba, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on, on, on matrix. Um, uh, Mariology, right? Mariology in the Catholic Church, because they'll say she has this special place, right? She has this special place of exaltation. Come on, it's true, but it's not. But it's not accurate. She she's just an instrument, a vessel of grace being used by the Lord. That's all she is. Each one of us, whether you're a member in a church, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a missionary. We, we all have the same grace. We're all in union. We all ha we have different callings. God gives different grace for those callings. But our status before God, in the presence of God, it's all the same. These two, these, you're absolutely right. These are inseparable. These are, these are in, the, uh, essentially, these are, these are locked like a chain. The one who God is with, the one who the Lord is with has God's grace have here while she's considering this. So she does not know what's going on. The angel says to her, there's a command here. There's a command, a prohibition. Do not fear Mary for you have found favor with God. So again, so this is the, the reason here. But again, we should not view this as her earning. This is not her earning. This is the work of God in her life. So I, I want to stress, if these two are connected, again, this is God's work in her life, her, his grace. And what precedes all of this, right? The hall of faith in Hebrews 11 has taught us that whenever someone does a great work or is called to a commission, what's behind that is faith. So presuppose what's undergirding this, what's undergirding this is Mary's faith. We don't say, oh, she's just earning it, baby. No, we look at the theological truths that are taught, taught elsewhere. Paul said, Paul has been commissioned, but he says, it wasn't I that was working within me. It was the spirit the spirit that strengthened me, the spirit that energized me, okay? And so we can see here, and this is why looking at theology from a theological framework, we, we would not develop from this passage a works-based merit system for, for Mary to be doing this task. We have to come at it from a theological framework. We're making observations and questions, but because faith isn't, the, the faith of Mary isn't mentioned, doesn't mean she wasn't a woman of faith. She's full of faith. Her obedience, what guided her obedience underneath that was faith. And you see that later on in the, if you continue to read in the, towards the end, the, the Magnificat, Mary's Magnificat, she says that she declares her commitment to the Lord as her savior. And so clearly what's going on is her faith that's guiding this, okay? Big idea here. What can we describe from here to here? 
what can we describe this as? Big idea here. What can we describe this as? One or two words. I'm asking for the, the, the topic. The, the, what's the big topic from, from here to here? And the clue is in the action words and the tenses of the action words. Let's, let's highlight the action words first, then we can maybe make a big idea. So what are the action words here? So, someone just call it out. What are the action words? Yeah, so we have will conceive, will give birth, will call, will be great, will be called, will give, will reign, will have. What's the commonality in all of those? What's the common no, word, cheap. specifically in action, time reference, past, present, future? Uh, future. Future. They're all future actions and states. Who is, who is the speaker? Who, who is the... Who is the it's speaker? Angel, here? angel comes. The, the father through Gabriel. Excellent. So we have the speaker is the angel. That's the means. And then the actor, in fact, is God the Father. So what we have here is let's let's combine all of this. What we have here, and maybe this is you're like, oh Tim, I knew what you were saying there, but just so that we're clear, this is a prophecy or prophetic message. Notice this here. The prophetic message precedes the action. So what we can say here is that the actor who is God, God is ordaining these events. God is not looking into the future and just predicting what will happen. God is ordaining the events. Can we say the fulfillment of promise? Yeah, and so this is this is both a this is so no excellent point. This is both fulfillment, fulfillment, and promise. So when we're preaching, I would have I'd have three points here if I was preaching this. Okay, and you can change from introduction. You can have other points from a presentation perspective i think we should have we should have three major points okay and if you want if you want to move this up to here that's fine you can do that that's fine as well you could have command promise or prophecy now look here so the the will conceive behold you yourself will conceive this is concerning the the virgin birth, okay? And we have, precedent, we have precedent for that. We have precedent for that in just the succeeding passage. So we have in Luke 135, Mary says, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. So looking at Luke, if you have time, you can go there, 135. And the statement is the Holy Spirit will do this. And then we can refer to Matthew 1, 18 to 22, and Isaiah 7, 14. So the big idea here is that the virgin birth is being, pro is being prophesied, okay? And this will be fulfilling, right? So this is going to be undoing the Adamic curse. So even here, we can have, we have Think about this. We have hints of Adam and curse, right? The other thing that you notice here is that the, the, the Greek verb, the accent is on you yourself. There is no man involved in this process. And the Greek verb actually brings, it's a middle. So a middle, a Greek middle voice. So you have an active voice. The subject is the actor. You have a passive voice in Greek, which is the subject is the object. It's receiving the action. And then you have a middle voice, which emphasizes that the, that the, the subject is the actor and the subject is doing it themselves. Now, of course, Mary is not the one doing it herself in the sense that she is creating the conception, but that there's no one else involved. There's no man involved. Okay. 
No man is involved in this birth, okay? The next thing we see here is that we see that the name is going to be Jesus, okay? You will call his name Jesus, all right? And so this is this comes from the the Hebrew Joshua. So maybe you already know this. This is let's just highlight this though. So we have Jesus comes from Jesus in in Greek, and this is from uh, Yehoshua, and this literally means God saves, the Lord saves. And Matthew will highlight that this is primarily concerning the sins of the people. So, So whatever else we see of Jesus, whatever else, huge debate now. He is king, yes. He is God, yes. But his fundamental act, his name is Jesus. <laughs> the fundamental act is not saving us from poverty. The fundamental act is not giving us an example to follow. The fundamental act is not exercising reign. He will do that in the future. He exercises reign while he's on earth. But the fundamental act of all the other names, you will call his name Jesus. Yeshua, the Lord saves his people from their sins. And this comes right back. Matthew makes this explicit in Matthew 1, 22 to 23. And the amazing thing is that it's also Emmanuel, which is God with us. So it's God with us and God saving us from our sins. Fundamental. The next thing that we see here is that he's going to be great. He's going to be great. And to what extent will he be great? Okay. And, and Mary is going to bring up this. And so let's look at Mary's prayer. So two things, I, I just highlight two passages for us. And then we can look at them. Luke 1, 46 to 55, and Philippians 2, 9 to 11. To what extent will he be great? To what extent will he be great? Let's look at how the extent to which he will be great here. So Luke 1, 46. The Lord said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. He has looked on my humble estate of his servant. From now on, generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things in me and in his, and his holy name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of a humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has swept away with nothing. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. But come back up here. He's doing this all through his arm, who is Jesus. He has shown strength with his arm. He had, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Let's go quickly to Philippians. To what extent now explicitly is Jesus great? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the father. So this is the extent to which Jesus will be great. (laughs) The son of the highest, he will be called the son of the highest. And so this signifies for us, this signifies for us the fact that he is the son of God. Why, why use the term highest? The reason for using the term highest is because this is, at, this is ex, 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 accenting the, the height, the height of God, and also his future exaltation. Okay. And so let's come back here to another example. If we've looked at this before, Ephesians 1, 19, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. 
the son of the highest, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but the age to come. The highest. <laughs> There's so many rules and authority. So many kings. So many institutions. The highest of all is God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. Moving along here, and there's more. I'm going to, I'll share a handout with more of these details. The next thing I want to see, we want to see here is the Lord will give to him the throne of David, his father. The throne, the, the Lord will give to him the throne of David, his father. And so fundamental to Jesus's work after saving his people from their sins is a word we can use here is the enthronement. The enthronement of Jesus. We have the enthronement of Jesus here. The throne of David, his father. Okay. And then here we have uh, the next promise is, so we have, um, we can see a clear progression here, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a clear progression moving along here. Right, there's a, there's a clear progression, although we have and, 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 and. So you could see a progression like this, or you could see a, a central idea here, right? There's no and. So the focus then is on his greatness, right? So you have three ands on either side, or you have a three ends and four ends, right? But there's no and right here. Is everyone tracking there with me? So the accent's going right to he will be great. <laughs> And they would do this in Hebrew, the Hebrew um, language. Obviously, this is written in Greek, but there is this, the Hebrew framework and way of thinking with, with, um, with, with poetry and songs. And so I do think there is a tension being drawn to the fact that he will be great. But anyway, here, so we have the Lord will give to him the throne of David, his father, enthronement. And so this is, this is picking up on 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm Two, okay, explicit. Look at this here. He will reign. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And so this is, this is rule. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And so here now we have this time referent. This is this is a time referent, and his kingdom will have no end. So he will reign forever. His kingdom will be established forever. So, so kingdom is much more than just reign. Right? It's land, wealth, life, families, culture. So like a king, you know, a king can reign for a very long time, right? but it can be a very cheap and poor rule, right? So not only does he reign, but his kingdom, his kingdom's going to be blessed. The kingdom will, will be there forever, okay? Now, the question is the house of Jacob, the house of Jacob. And you're like, ah, oh, Tim, what does this mean? Is this, just a, is this just like a subpar reign? Is this just a subpar reign, Tim? I'm... I'm, I'm I'm struggling with this, okay? Let's look at all the, so one of the questions was look at the Jewish references, right? So let's go back and look at the Jewish references. And what I wanna see here is that, um, right? So even, so coming over here, right? So, so you have both here, you have, let's just be clear. You have house of David and house of Israel, right? Is everyone tracking there with me? And so here, David is reigning over the house of Israel and his house is established. So what I'm trying to get at coming over to here is that these are not, it's not that he's reigning over Jacob, but not Israel, or he's reigning over Jacob, but not Abraham, that he's reigning over, reigning over Jacob, but not the rest of the world, right? Is everyone, is everyone tracking there with me? If we're accepting these, 
as promises, then this is saying nations, right? Nations. Everyone tracking there with me? Now, let me bring over a parallel here, if everyone can see this here. And so I'm just going to, to blow this up here. We can, you can look at this later. I'll, I'll, I'll prepare this. I'll send this handout out. Notice this here, okay? So right now we're looking at this. When you actually look at the different references in all of Luke's chapters, you, re you realize, oh, House of Jacob is just one of many. They're all the same, okay? So Luke 1.16, uh, John is for the children of Israel. Luke 1.27, the house of David, Luke 133, the house of Jacob, which is this reference, Luke 154, servant of Israel, referring to, uh, I believe that's Jesus. Uh, yeah, servant of Israel, Luke, Luke 155, Abraham and his offspring, Luke 177, God's people, Luke 210, all the people, all the people. So what I'm trying to get at here is that all of these references are appropriate to hear. So who is, so let's be clear here. Who is he reigning over? He's reigning over all of these. <laughs> this is just, this is just one example. It, they're just synonymous. Okay. Now there is of course the accent on the promise. I'm not denying there's an accent on the promise to Abraham and confirmed with Jacob. Okay. But remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So, so Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So house of Jacob, house of Israel is literally the same. There is no difference. The accent might just be on, the, on Jacob as there isn't. It's, it's just the word that he chose. Uh, so here, let's, let's go to one passage to end. We're going to put, we're going to seal the deal here on this. Okay, so look at, let's go to Luke. So this is in the subsequent context, Luke. 2.10, Luke 2.10. Here we go. You can see it in the middle here. So again, there's the, the angel comes to the, to the shepherds. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So obviously that includes Jew and Gentile. And here's the, here's the, the crux. Four, four, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Who does this benefit? Does this benefit Jew and Gentile? Yes. The city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This is the gospel. I bring you the gospel. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And so although for sure the accent here the accent here is on the house of Jacob. You couldn't say he's just reigning over the house of Jacob. He's not reigning over the earth. He's not reigning over all the people. He's not reigning over, you know, Abraham. It's just Jacob. Nalan. It's like, no, <laughs> that's just one example. And you could use all of this. Okay. The, the big idea. So then this, so then this gets to, well, why would he use this? Okay. So let's just come back here. So with what Diba we saw last week or, or two weeks ago with Abraham, how the new covenant was just the promises were interrelated with Abraham and we're talking about this greater. So, so let's just be clear. Let's, 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 let's look at relationships here. Okay. So you have covenant with Abraham covenant with that's reconfirmed with Jacob. You have old covenant. You have new covenant. And then just, just to, to make a spot here, you have Davidic covenant. All of these are within the covenant of grace, different manifestations, because all of these find their fulfillment in Jesus. And all of this is literally God's grace to us with concerning redemption. This, the, the, the fulfillment of this is in here. Um, so, so this is both part of the covenant of grace and, and in one sense, without going into all those details, okay? So, so I'm not trying to go, there's nuances we have to work through, fair enough, okay? But what I'm trying to get at is, is that this was, this was confirmed with Jacob. Um, 
is that all of this finds their fulfillment in Jesus. All these covenants find their fulfillment in Jesus. And so that's why from a big redemptive perspective, you, maybe you've heard of this before in theology. You'll hear of creation, fall, redemption, and then you have consummation. So the redemption part goes right in here. So if you can imagine this whole, this whole thing, this is all coming within this category. So another way that we can look at this is we could even look at this another way. We could say old covenant, new covenant, one administration, two administration. And this is all within the covenant of grace. Again, we're looking at big picture. We're looking at big picture here. And again, this is coming back to the idea of the covenant of grace. You could just even just say agreement. It's the promise to save a people through God's grace. That's all it is. And it has to begin with Adam and Eve, meaning this is concerning belief. Belief all the way to eternal kingdom. Because even when you're looking at kingdom, this is coming back to the, the creation uh, the creation commission, right? Is everyone tracking there with me? To have dominion. Okay? So even, even this reigning over the house of Jacob forever, this is coming back to, to creation. <laughs> The, 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 the dominion of all of all things through Christ. So these are all interrelated in one sense. They're all, they're, they're all being fulfilled in each other and they're climaxing. Okay. So this is why Paul will say, let me, let's go to one passage here. Just, just to, just to give you, just to give you something beautiful here to see and to consider second Corinthians one verse 18. Sure, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you is has not been yes or no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim to you, Salvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes or no, but in him it's always yes. <laughs> For all the promises of God find their yes in him. <laughs> promise to Abraham, promise to Jacob. Promise to Eve, promise to David, promise in the new covenant. <laughs> that it is why it is through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. So there's various fulfillments. There is complexity here. I don't want to, I don't want to flatten all of this out, but we can't look at it primarily in disjunctive categories. We have to look at it in, in fulfillment categories. And I'll get to you in a second, Paul. Okay. The big idea here is that Jesus is fulfilling the Davidic covenant and it's bringing in, right? Even, even for Abraham, part of the promises was to have a great name, to be, to have Kings come from his loins, to have, to be Kings, to be over Kings. This is bringing into clarity that promise now fulfilled in the, the Davidic seed. And so the big idea for us is that here, what, what have we gained in Christ, the son of David, eternal kingdom reigning over all, over all, over all nations, over the whole earth. That's the big idea. Uh, that's not a question. I just look at the Psalm 105, verse 6. Uh, children of Jacob is chosen once. So therefore, there's this uh, children of Jacob are people who are believers. Yeah. Excellent. There is this accent on the name Jacob. So let's just, I'll just add a quick qualification here. This is an accent on Jewish promises. So I think that's what, I think that's what Pastor Cloyd and, and Paul is saying, correct? And I like it. That's good. Okay. And so uh, benefit for all though. Okay. Can we, can we agree to that? 
Jesus can reign all day, but if he hasn't saved us from our sins and giving us a new, a new life, we can never be in his kingdom. <laughs> corruptible has to take on incorruptible. Mortality has to take on immortality. 